Hey, what's up everybody? I just received production samples of the SCART to DVI boards from Insurrection Industries. So I wanted to walk everybody through how you can get amazing quality captures or streams by going direct from the console into a very inexpensive setup. Inexpensive compared to all the crazy upscalers in the retro gaming world. So let me give you a tour of what I'm doing and we'll do a test stream. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the rig that we have here. This is just a small form factor PC that I got off of eBay for under a hundred bucks. It came with an SSD built in that when doing testings actually had pretty fast write speeds. And then I also installed a brand new Samsung SSD for read speeds. So just as a basic hardware setup, you know, decent PC, I believe it's an i5 SSDs. The video card doesn't really matter and then I'm reading from the OS and recording to the other drive. The two very important upgrades that I did do besides the SSD is this is that Asus video card, that, or audio card that I talked about in the previous capture video. And then of course, the Datapath Vision E1S. So we're just gonna take the board. This is my first time even opening it. So as you can see, Insurrection did a great job. Uh, whoever makes these are really high quality. So let's get this plugged into the machine. So we'll need a few other things. Um, first, you're going to need a power cable. I like these short little USB adapter cables here. And that could just be powered right from any of the USB ports. Next, you'll need audio, which once again, I like these brand new short little audio adapters. I believe these are from Cable Direct. And that goes right there into the audio jack. Let me get a close-up for everybody so you can see that. And then of course I have a DVI dongle because I don't want to add any cables to it. I want the shortest connection possible. So we're just going to plug that into the adapter, plug audio into the output, power it with the USB cable, and then we'll take our Super Nintendo SCART cable plug that directly in and connect that to the PC. So that's pretty much the whole setup. You just have a Super Nintendo that's powered and going directly through RGB SCART into the Datapath E1S powered by USB and audio going into the higher end Asus audio card. Also, just keep in mind that here is the switch for the low pass filter and for the sync stripper. So when you first plug your console into this, you're gonna want both of these switches facing the power and audio ports. So power and audio ports are on, pushed towards the PC itself or off. Um, you might not need either of these, I'll talk about that later on, but definitely start out with them on just so you get a reading. Before we get started in the software setup, I just wanted to show the monitor that I chose to use. This is just simply a 1024 by 768 15 inch LCD. And the reason I wanted this one specifically is because be, due to the low resolution, this 320 by 240 screen will take up more of the screen. So in contrast, if I had something like a 22 inch 1080p monitor, this screen would be about a quarter of the size and really hard to see. So doing it this way, I don't even need a magnifying glass to zoom in. I could very easily see the different settings. All right, so I just switched over to a 1080p monitor um, just so it's easier for people to follow. But to be honest, as long as it has a digital input, like a DVI input, that's all that would matter. Um, if you use VGA in order to calibrate what we're about to show you, then it really won't work. So any display is fine as long as it's DVI. I just like to use the other ones. Um, also, I'm not going to go through each individual step because I already did that in a previous video. Um, if you'd like to see exactly why I'm doing all of these things, please reference that video. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to run through all of the steps. And I'm also going to show the original method that I showed in the previous video just to get us started. So you're going to get everything configured in the main vision window. I'm going to run the 240p test suite. 
here's where we set phase. So here's the part where if you were using a VGA connection, you might actually get some interference. Uh, and to be honest, due to the way I'm capturing this desktop, it's probably not gonna look right on the screen as well. I'm sorry about that. This is actually the second time that I've had to, uh, to go back and redo these parts because of some of the capture settings. So please excuse if what you're seeing is a little, uh, a little choppy. So we got the correct horizontal size. We have all of uh, the capture settings configured properly. Now I'm just gonna load up Mortal Kombat and do a basic capture. So I guess I'll add me in first. Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna add a logo just because, just to show an example. Not a good logo, but it'll get us started. Obviously there's different scenes and things you could do with OBS. Um, in fact, there's a lot of really awesome things that you could do. So I recommend looking into that uh, if, you're, if you've never done any kind of pro streams before. Uh, okay, so I'll make sure to turn the webcam volume down. Um, the audio input capture seems to be fine for Mortal Kombat. Now I just have to add in. So the one thing to do, if you're gonna do the direct capture method, um, you need to set in the 320 by 250. Oop. As you can see here, sometimes dialing in the resolution auto fills itself and it kind of goes crazy. Um, but other than that, uh, you could just go through, set all the settings. You're going to have to make sure this matches, so yours might not be XRGB or 709. Uh, you really are going to need to know the input signal that you have, but that's kind of a more advanced thing for another day. So once we're here, we have the original, uh, the original capture coming through, and you could just go to Transform, Edit Transform, and if you see the size is 320 by 250, let's do a 5x scale. So I'll just... Uh, Visualize it here. 320 times 5 is 1600. And of course, 1250 times 5, is, uh, or 250 times 5 is 1250. Hopefully, I didn't need a calculator to prove that to you. <laughs> and there we go. I'm going to line that up. Now, as you can see, it's a little bit blurry. So just right click, and scale filtering is point which I believe is the same as nearest neighbor because it gets you a pretty darn sharp image. And I'm also just gonna move this down the list so that my webcam can be properly sat over it if it, uh, if it extends at all. So now I'm just gonna show an example of what this looks like. Uh, and if you get any slowdown or choppiness, please excuse it because this would definitely be the method that I'm capturing it through a different laptop, saving it to this. Um, this would be either a, a, a capture or a stream at the moment, um, and I'm just doing record capture to a hard drive. Um, you know, some people like to split the output, some people uh, like to actually just use the vision window and game right on that. I find the vision window to have just enough latency to make me not play the game as well, <laughs> as you can see right here. So, you know, this really depends on the speed of the computer, um, how much latency affects you and all that stuff. But overall, uh, I think most people would probably end up splitting, but hey, give it a try. Maybe you could just do a direct capture method and play right on whatever flat screen monitor you're using. So that's it. That's just a very basic how to get direct capture right through OBS uh, in 5x scaling and have it look pretty good. But now I want to show a few other methods. Okay, now I want to show a more advanced capture method called oversampling. I'm going to use a program called VCS and not the vision window for this. Uh, and I'm also going to switch over to a Sega Genesis to kind of prove the point a little bit further. So right now, according to the R3 wiki, the recommended horizontal size is 427. But if you look at the actual calculated time, it's 427.5 meaning you're always gonna be just a hair off when dialing in something like the checkerboard pattern. So what we're gonna do is oversample the horizontal resolution to match that to get an even number. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, this is detected at 320 by 240, so I'm gonna pull out the calculator and get these numbers. 
So since it's at 320 by 240, let's just dial in the 427 number that's there just to kind of demo this in real time. And we'll go into the checkerboard pattern and you'll see phase looks good at about nine. So that's how the normal setup would be, 427, 320 by 240. But why don't we do a 6x oversample? So 320 times six is actually 1920. And now we're gonna keep the same vertical height of 240 that the VCS window detected. And as you can see, the window goes all crazy, but now we're gonna get it to match here. So 427.5 times six, equals 2565. So there you go right there. I'll go back vertical position 12. I'm assuming that the horizontal position is gonna to have to move all the way over. But the one thing to note here is phase doesn't need to be set when you're oversampling at all, which could be a pretty big deal for people depending how, uh, how you like to do this. It's in fact best to set phase just at zero uh, but now that we're stuck with this ultra-wide image, how do we go about getting it back to normal? Go into the Output tab of VCS, make sure Upscaler and Downscaler are both set to Nearest, and set the resolution back to 320. So I know it seems a little bit counterintuitive because you just did a 6x scale and then a 6x back, but there's a few huge advantages of this. The first, of course, is the phase because it doesn't really do anything and you don't need to worry about setting it. But the other thing is the low pass filter, which I'll show in a second. Let me just get you set back up into OBS. So now you could go into window capture and just select the VCS uh, with the same title up here. And I'm gonna back out and uh, I'll just go into a test pattern just so we could see it on screen. So now the same as before, you're going to do a transform and uh, we'll just do the same 5x as before. So 320 times five is 1600, 240 times five is 1200. Oh, hit the wrong button. And of course you have to set the scale filtering to point, otherwise you're gonna get a blurry image. This is more like the nearest neighbor image. So now that we have this image oversampled and put into a 5x window, I wanna show something else that's kinda of cool about oversampling. If we turn off the low pass filter, the thing that was so necessary in all of the direct capture, you actually get a sharper image. And that's because the low pass filter uses something called a Butterworth filter. Yes, it's actually called a Butterworth filter. Um, but that ends up doing one pixel smearing across and you can see it between the green and the red and to be honest it's kind of the uh, the least worst of if you're just doing basic direct captures having that filter on removes so much unwanted noise uh, that it's worth a little bit of pixel smearing but turning it off as we can see here when you're using oversampling uh, I think it actually looks better so while oversampling will use a little bit more CPU usage um, and it's a bit more of a pain to set up you could, if you wanted, get original resolution copies, uh, or captures, I mean, or streams like this, regardless of what you oversample it to. So it kind of accomplishes my original goal of getting, you know, your basic 240p capture uncompressed, uh, but at the same time, it allows you to do the amazing oversampling type of stuff. So now let's check out Mortal Kombat Genesis oversampled. Um, it's kind of hard to tell right now in the capture window, but I have a feeling this is going to look a little bit sharper than before and not having to worry about filtering or with uh, or messing with the phase setting is probably a good thing. So once again, it's a more advanced way to capture. If you're trying to be a perfectionist in these things, this might be a better way for you to do it. Um, but there's actually another reason why you might want to oversample. So here's an example of the Sega 32X with the Sega Genesis. And this is kind of an interesting use case because the Genesis draws some of the backgrounds while the 32X draws some of the foregrounds in most 32X games. And both are slightly out of phase of each other. 
So you very often get ghosting and not the greatest picture when trying to capture 32X. So here's the exact same settings I just showed, but with a 32X. The strange thing that I found though was, unlike just using the Genesis, if I turn the low pass filter off, I actually end up getting more noise than with it on. So that was kind of a interesting thing. Um, I'd be looking forward to see what happens if we got uh, the, th the 240p test suite ported to the 32X. Uh, but let me turn the filter back on and you should have seen an immediate difference in the video. So uh, for the rare case where you might want to capture 32X, this seems like uh, definitely the right choice because I don't think there's any way that you can get both of them in phase together. You'd have to just kind of sidestep the phase like this. Uh, and once again, the SCART to DVI board has that low pass filter just for these situations. Um, oversampling should have gotten us no need for a filter, but who knows what's going on in that 32X. So uh, overall, this looks great. And uh, I think this is going to be my go-to for capturing, capturing 32X. Because unfortunately, other than using emulation, there's no other way to get it to look good. At least none that I've found. Capturing HDMI is very similar. There's just one major difference, and that's splitting off audio. So right now I have the Mega SG, which is outputting HDMI. And kind of funny, it's actually powered by the same cable the SCART to DVI was powered from. Uh, but that's going over to a View HD splitter. And the purpose of this is both to split the HDMI, which is great if you're doing something like um, giving this a native HDMI source and then splitting to a different monitor that you're actually playing on uh, so you don't have to play on the capture solution. And of course, that's going to an analog audio breakout that's going to the exact same 3.5 millimeter audio cable that we used before. And then the output is just a standard HDMI to DVI cable for the vision. Uh, and that's really it. I mean, it's about as easy as that. It does add one more device to the mix, but in my opinion, this is a device that you'd probably want to use anyway, simply because there's many scenarios in which you would want to split the, your HDMI output to game on one solution and capture on the other. Also, it has optical audio output as well, so if you wanted to get a higher-end capture card, you could certainly even use the optical capture as well. Okay, so now that we have the Mega SG connected, I'm just going to open up the vision window uh, and go into input settings just to double check. Uh, sometimes input settings takes a while to pop up, so we'll just give it a minute. But 1920 by 1080 at 60 hertz. Uh, you don't even need this open anymore. That was really for me just to verify what was going through. Now we're just going to add that video capture device. And once again, I'm going to manually put in all the settings. Uh, if you're not sure what to put in or if you don't know what things like the video format or color space are, that's going to have to be a different video altogether because that gets a little bit complicated. Um, but there we go. Okay, so apparently I screwed up the audio settings in this part and my voice didn't record correctly and I didn't realize it until it was too late. So what you hear isn't going to match what you see on screen. But the whole point of this short section is just to show that while this video is dedicated to direct capture, you could certainly use the Datapath Vision card for any 1080p60 source, whether it's coming from a FrameMeister or direct from a console. So uh, while I'm obviously a huge fan of direct retro console capture and streaming, um, you could certainly use these cards and these inexpensive PCs to do whatever you'd like. So that's pretty much it. I know this solution isn't for everybody, and I think for many people just getting the cheapest USB capture card you could afford and using a laptop is probably best. But if you're looking to get a new capture solution or upgrade your old one, or if you really are just looking for the best, direct capture is something you should really consider. And both for the accuracy and of course the archiving of one-to-one -one uncompressed original captures, but just the cost overall. Because if you think about the cost of an OSSC or a FrameMeister and then a very good quality capture card that's able to have the correct frame rate, resolution, and color compression, or lack of color compression, you're really talking a lot more. I mean, the PC cost uh, just over $100 with the upgraded SSD, so with the second one that I bought. Um, you could have that $40 ASUS internal card, or you could upgrade to something like one of the Sound Blaster ones 
Those are around $100, but they give you optical audio capture as well, and they're available externally and internally, so that might be better for you. And of course, you could still pick up the Datapath Vision cards for around $150, and since they're half-height cards, a small form factor solution like that one might even be best for you. Any monitor at all will do for capture, because you really just need an interface to capture or to view your capture solution on and make the configurations. I do prefer that tiny 15 inch monitor back there for setup just because it really makes it easier to calibrate in the phase um, simply just because this the vision window is going to be bigger on a lower resolution screen. But overall, including everything here, <laughs> including that 15 inch monitor, the total solution that I showed here was under $500. And the only thing that's not counted is the game hardware itself. So not counting the Super Nintendo and the RGB cable. Everything else was just under 500. And that says a lot because you can get FrameMeister solutions that are still close to that just for the FrameMeister itself. And then of course the OSSC is much cheaper, but there's always compatibility issues with certain capture cards and stuff like that. So while this isn't for everybody, it's something I hope people consider. The SCART to DVI boards are available from Insurrection Industries right now. The component to DVI will be available soon, and those will have filters that work with not just 240p and 480i, but also 480p, 720p, and 1080i, but don't use interlaced for, for capture. Go with the 720p. So uh, after that, we're looking to expand to VGA and stuff like that, but it's always going to be designed with this capture solution in mind which is why I really wanted to take the time to show this setup. Uh, anybody interested, the previous much longer and more detailed video I have up is a great way to start. Uh, things are always being updated and methods are changing, so the pages on the website are definitely what you would want to go to for that. But overall, just check it out and see if it's for you. And if you're looking to purchase a capture setup, this might be the one that you're interested in. Well, that's it for this time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider signing up for any of the support platforms like Patreon or Bitbacker, because without the support of all of my backers, there's no way any of these videos or projects or some of the behind the scenes stuff like the SCART to DVI project could ever be made. Also, please subscribe to the channel and make sure to check out the weekly podcast that lets you know what's going on in the retro gaming world, keeping everybody up to speed.